Welcome to the Momentum Collective podcast. Momentum Collective provides training spaces and community around the world for unconventional minds and nomads to co-create the future. This podcast shares ideas on how we can transcend and shift towards our highest self. Hello everyone, my name is John Early. Thank you for tuning into the Momentum Collective podcast. I'm really excited to be here in beautiful Tel Aviv in Israel with a good friend, Michael Bauer, uh, author of Israel Journey, Eight Days in One of the World's Most Complex Countries and Complex Indeed. Uh, We've just come off of a week-long education seminar across Israel by Community Builders Program of Reality Israel. And um, Michael was our main, main educator. And firstly, I want to commemorate you for being able to give such Uh, a beautiful uh, and neutral and nuanced um, history and context to such a complex place. Thank you. So, (laughs) thank you for taking the time. I would argue that I was not neutral, but maybe I was fair. Well, that, that, that I think is the first question is, is it possible to be neutral when you're educating or speaking about Israel, about the Middle East, about the whole history here? I think that when you go and you study a topic like Israel, Uh, and we'll take Israel as an example. Uh, When people are engaged, when people are part of the story themselves, I think it's too much to ask them to be neutral. Right. Uh, Everyone is carrying their own backpack. So if you, for example, if you're looking at here at Israel, myself, my dad came here in 1948, you know, for that war called War of Independence, that Arabs will call Nakba. Um, Me, myself, I also served with the Israeli military. I've got five kids. One is going into the military in two weeks. So I think that to expect me to be a neutral speaker, educator, is unfair. Right. But uh, as someone that uh, is very much engaged in also the Palestinian story, Arab story, and Middle East studies in general, I always try and do my best to be just fair. Uh, right. And that's a big difference between neutral or objective to fair. Right. And you'd often kind of go between maybe putting on different hats of like, if I were to say this in this context, it would right. be taken, because everything that is said specifically around history, it's going to be a political statement. It's going to be a religious statement of some kind. Absolutely. Um, so it's hard to, you're always having to jump back and forth across different lines. Absolutely. I mean, every, I mean, you ask me historically, what happened in 1948? Well, is it the War of Independence or is it Nakba? We go to Jerusalem. We enter a specific gate. You ask me, what's the name of the gate? Jaffa Gate for Jews and Christians. Uh, Bab al-Halil in Arabic for the Muslims. So almost every language, every conversation is actually political. Right. Um, so as long as you don't have multiple narratives around you, as someone that is leading you through the different stories, I see that as an obligation of providing you multi-narratives right. constantly. Well, why don't we take a step back in time to give a bit of context to um, this space, this country, um, and where we're at today? Uh, the space, big, the big, big question. Right, yeah. I'm trying to think, you know, what, what is actually the question or how far do we go to? Well, I mean, I think um, we could go back to even um, the start of Judaism and, right. and how it was the first monotheistic religion. Um, so, and, and we can fast forward so, from there. You know, when you're looking at, you know, when you're talking about Israel in general, uh, always I, it's important for me to clarify for people to understand the difference between the land and the state. Right. The state is a political entity and we can argue it's politics until tomorrow. The land is a given geography uh, with people. So the state of Israel is a new concept. Right. And the land of Israel is an ancient land over here. Um, when we're going, so if you mention to monotheism, so we give credit to the biblical text uh, for Abraham introducing monotheism. If we would be on an academic study right now, which we are not, we, would, we could argue that one also but I would ignore that one. Um, and when you're looking at the monotheistic religion starting over here with Abraham starting that dynasty, uh, which leads to the Israelites, uh, which eventually became Judeans and become Jews. Uh, and if Abraham is about 3,700 years ago, so 2,000 years ago, approximately, we have the story of Jesus Christ and Christianity developing also over here. Uh, in many ways, out of Judaism uh, itself, or at least if I want to be sensitive, the religion itself and the faith is starting among people that were monotheistic, if I'm looking at the disciples that Mary, Joseph and such. And then approximately uh, 600 to 700 years later, Islam, also monotheistic, also very much influenced by the previous monotheistic religion, is also developing in the Middle East. 
And somehow the three religions tied themselves, especially with a place which is not here, not here in Tel Aviv, but about an hour here yeah. on a drive or, you know, a day on a donkey <laughs> to the most important place in the region, Jerusalem. Mm. And somehow Jerusalem is a place where a lot of those religions, once the story arrives at Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, the story themselves developed and created the monotheistic religion as we know it today. And that's a blessing, and that's a curse also in yeah. this place. Because the challenge of that story is that while we have a lot of, and I'm sit, we're sitting around over here, and there's a lot of things that are factual that you know I can prove to you scientifically with carbon dating, or we can say how old is this building, how old is that building. But when it comes to faith, it actually means that a fact for one is not a fact for another. So when you have our city, our region, our land, which different people and a lot of people are attached differently and see facts that have to do with the land uh, as the most important facts of life, but at the same time for the other, it will be fake news, it, cre it creates a very challenging dynamic between the different uh, mm -hmm. religion people. And right. Such. Yeah, and to see how a the, the three, some of the biggest religions in the world, obviously, it's affected billions of people, all coming back to one place, right. and kind of over time built on top of each other, and even stemming from some of the same history, some of the same stories, the stuff from the Old Testament, and like you said, the Ab Abrahamic religions, I guess you'd call right. them, correct? And so, of course, there's going to be tension there when you have multiple right. things coming together, and that's. And that's not even going into the subsects of all the other tensions within those religions themselves and, and those things themselves. Absolutely. And again, the, the religion, I wouldn't underestimate religion, but uh, religion is not the only challenge that we have over here. And right. nationalism that right. developed in Europe and kind of like arrived to the Middle East, uh, nationalism is also part of it. And nationalism has to do with religion, but not always 100%. So also right. we have got a lot of national conflicts uh, right. over here. And I think that was something you had brought up on, on our excursions as well, of how tribal mentality was more of the reign here versus a, more of a nationalistic thing. And that's really quite a new concept that's come in to right. visit these areas. Right. So generally, if you had in the Middle East, like in Africa and like in any other place or many other places that I'm not familiar with, you had the concept of tribalism. And then if I'm looking back for the last, let's say, 3,000 years, so you have tribalism on the ground, and then usually the region around multiple tribes is managed by a certain empire. In Arabic, later on, when Islam is re revealed, they don't call it imperialism. Imperialism is a European Western concept, but right. a caliphate mindset. Right. But generally, you've got that umbrella of an ideology or of an entity which is overlooking multiple tribes with all sort of different ways of governing it. What happened in the 19th century, a few things happened. First of all, as I mentioned, nationalism, which started in Europe, perhaps following the French Revolution, arrived to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. And then also identity started to change. If once identity had to do with the family, which is the tribe, I would ask you, what are you? I am John. Okay, John what? Most likely, you would say your family. And the family in the region is an extended family. Then religion started to form also an identity. So, who are you? Well, I'm John from that family. And I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Shia, I'm a Sunni, I'm a Jew. That, that added to it. And then, with the national element of the 19th century that's arriving, slowly you see, okay, so you're Israeli, you're Palestinian, you're Iraqi, you are. So you have those layers of identities. And identities, on one hand, are a blessing. The challenge is what happens when identities are in conflict with one another. And if you're looking today at the Middle East and Israel within, I would say that the challenge of the Middle East today, perhaps beyond the Middle East, but we're talking about here, is the conflict between the different identities. Whether it's a national identity, whether it's a religious identity, whether it's a, whatever you want to define it, it's a, the conflict and the relationship between the different identities. Right. Over here. And especially, I think, when you identify I think identity is a big component here, um, and especially when people identify as being, I don't, maybe use the word victim, but you know, I think like you mentioned before, there's a lot of trauma that's within the Jewish heritage and the people of different, the Babylonians taking over, right. or the Romans taking over, or the, the, the Turk coming in. Right. So there's always this kind of a thing of not having a space to call your own. 
and 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 then also on on the Palestinian side, maybe we'll uh, put the Palestinian hat on. What do you feel um, is you've worked alongside many Palestinian educators? Right. Um, would you feel would be what what they've been calling it on their side? So you, you used two words here. One was uh, victim. Right. So I want to simplify. So the argument is who is the victim? Right. right. Uh, and generally, when a foreigner like you arrives, so we are both sides are trying to prove to you, no, we are the victim. We are the victim. Um, and then you talked about trauma or, or pain. You have here, and I'm referring to the Israeli-Palestinian issue or the Israeli-Arab right. domestic relation. Although we're in Tel Aviv, to our left is Kaplan Street. Literally, you can actually like the next uh, crossroad is where all the protests are happening every weekend. Right. Uh, for, so the which has, which, for the judicial reform, which is something completely different. That's our inner tribal right. battles within Jews, within Israel. That's a different story. But it's, I'll stick for the meanwhile for the Israeli Arab, Israeli Palestinian conflict. You have two people here that are coming with a backpack of pain. With uh, both of them are PTSD as a nation, other people. Um, and both of them are searching for recognition and acknowledgement and I would say that in addition you know we can go into the tactical issues who won in which battle and what you know what are the different rights and areas A and B and C but generally you're looking at two groups of people right now that are not receiving mutual recognition right uh, and if you remember when we were in Ramallah and we met with uh, Dr. Khalid in the, Chikaki, West, Bank, in the yeah. West Bank one of the things that he was able to prove almost scientifically that if the two people would be would be able to recognize the other's pain, that would be a good beginning for reconciliation. Right through the many polls. Right. That so you know. and then so you know we are talking about details and we open maps and all. But at the end of the day, you have two people that are looking for recognition. Yeah. And uh, one of the great models that I like to share in order to explain it, and uh, is the story of David and Goliath. Every, I don't know if everyone knows what David and Goliath is. David was uh, weak and small, apparently, and good-looking. And everyone loves him because he wins at the end of the battle. Against the big... Against the big Goliath, the Philistine, right? Big, strong uh, the man. big, strong man. And we're all in favor of David. Uh, by the way, also, if you go scientifically to the story, you will learn that whoever wrote that story probably worked for David. But that's a different story. We'll not go into those details. That's a different context of but, history. But in also important history. Right. Who right, writes the, the, who writes writes the story. story. But if we all like David, when I'm looking at the Israeli-Arab or Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and now I'm looking at the Arabs not of the region but within Israel, whether it's Palestinian of the West Bank or Arabs living within Israel, Arabs or Palestinians within Israel truly believe that they are David. Why? We're stronger financially, our military is stronger, apparently we have the West in America at our back, right? Mm. A startup nation, you're sitting over here, all the buildings around you are... Lots of new construction. It's all startup companies, I mean, it's whole buildings, <coughs> startup companies. So there are David and we are Goliath. And I, I agree with them, they're right, they are David. The only issue is that Jews see themselves, and me among them, also David. Because when they're looking at the Arab-Palestinian identity, they're not only looking at a minority here in the area, but they're looking at their Arab identity, which is the majority of the region. So when I'm zooming out, suddenly Israel is a weak, with its baggage of victimhood and so on, is the weak component in the region, whether you want to call it an Arab region or Muslim region. So two people truly are convinced that they're David. So the conflict, if I need to summarize it, it's not David against Goliath, it's who the hell is David. That's yeah. what it's all about. And I'm able to argue both sides easily. Right. And I think that's the difference that both can be true in these instances. Absolutely. Uh, when you're coming, and especially when it's, the conflict is really a, a mental conflict. It's a, a conflict of identity and of, of these other concepts. Um, the, what you said right now, both can be true. That two conflicting truths can both be true is one of the most challenging lessons to teach. Right. Because apparently, most of the people of the world are not able to understand that simple idea. Right. And therefore people are searching all the time to pick a side. Okay, I'm pro-Israel. No, I'm pro-Palestinian. I, I was. And you know, if you're Israel, you're Palestinian, I can understand that sentiment. Even, although we don't use that language. You find it in Canada. You find it on the campuses right. in Canada and the US. But why do you need to be pro-one? Why don't you be pro-people, right. pro-peace, pro-region, pro-both? I mean, this, I, this conversation internationally right. that people need to choose. 
it's actually very sad. Yeah. Uh, well, let's go into a bit of, we talked a bit about the history mm -hmm. of Israeli space, uh, state, and so forth. Um, and let's give a bit of history on the Palestinian people. Um, which, which areas did they come from or were they? So, as people, they're also old people, because old people are old. Because right. people are descendants of people that come before them. As an identity, as a group of people that call themselves Palestinian, that's relatively new. And now there's an argument among uh, Middle East uh, academics when exactly, because it's, a, it's an evolution, it's a process. Generally, you did not have any national identities in the Middle East. Not Israeli, not Jordanian, not Iraqi, not Syrian, not Lebanese. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you had either religious identity or tribal identity. So like you didn't have a Jordanian identity, you didn't have a Palestinian identity. But slowly, as the West did arrive after World War I, in this case British and France, bringing with it national identities also, or perhaps trying to implement national identities on the region over here, uh, and eventually forming states, forming a Jordan, forming a Syria, forming a Lebanon, all those countries that I'm mentioning are new concepts following World War I. Okay, World War I was 1914 to 1918. So within that, you've got a region over here, which was known as Palestine, also known as Land of Israel. Jews used to call it Land of Israel. Technically, it was called Palestine, named after a territory that the Roman Empire called it Philistine in order to actually remove the Jewish connection to the land. Now, there were Philistine people prior to 586, but they lost their identity. And then the region stayed. But the fact that you've got a region with a name doesn't mean that it formed an identity. In this case, the Arab people between the Jordan River to the Mediterranean that stayed in that area after the different states around were created started to strengthen their own identity. The conflict with the Jewish people, that part of them were here, but many of them started to immigrate because of their own ideology, because of persecution, because of a whole list of reasons, that even strengthened their own identity. Then in 1948, those Arab people, which in the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, which faced a huge trauma because of that war, trauma, unfortunately, strengthened identity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, by the way, also a lot of people will, Jews will feel that the Holocaust strengthened their identity, right? So, uh, but that's a different conversation. So anyhow, slowly you see those people, called the Arab people, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, defining themselves as Palestinian. So today it's very clear. There are, there is a Palestinian people. Though, Palestinian people are the Arab people who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, whether they live there today or they are descendants of Arabs that lived in that area prior to 47. Right. Because you have people that, as an outcome of that war in 1948, became refugees. And then they were born in Jordan, in Syria, in Toronto, wherever. Right. They also defined themselves as Palestinians, but they don't live here today. Right. And, and I think another big part that, um, when I was trying to do some research on this topic and this conflict, a lot of the finger and the blame, like a lot of big issues today, come back to colonialism, specifically England. And this is when England and France came in. They took control of some of the areas. And then when they realized it was a very complicated situation, it was kind of like tried to wash their hands of it. And then the UN came in. If you want to give a bit of so, context yeah, to... So I'll give you context and I'll tell you why it is not colonialism or why Israel is not colonialism. Um, first of all, when you're looking at Israel, so when people are talking about Israel as a colonial entity or idea, they are talking about the, you know, the Jewish Israel, the Jewish state. 50% of us, and you know, if we would walk around, you would see even by, by the looks, 50% of the Jews are from Arab countries, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Egypt. So first of all, you've got Middle Eastern people that are moving within the Middle East. That is something that happened all over the Middle East, and no one calls that colonialism. They're not from Europe. So first of all, 50% are not. Then the other 50% of Jews, right, let's say are originating from Europe. Those are people that survived a genocide that a European entity tried to do on them. Mm. That's not that Europe created this place over here. Europe actually tried to kill the Jews. The Jews who escaped and managed to survive came over here mm. without permission of the British mandate, in spite of the British mandate, and created, mostly illegally at the time, an entity of their own. So it is not because of Europe, it's not with the help of Europe, it's in, in spite of Europe, or despite of Europe, 
that we managed to create are partly European, partly Middle Eastern entity over here. Therefore, I would not use the word colonialism because it's way more complex mm. than that, right? I understand why people use that word because colonialism usually is a negative idea, right? And if there's no colonialism today, call it will colonialism and eventually there will not be an Israel. But, um, but as I said, just more complex than that. Right. But it, it was kind of an outside perspective coming in and assuming, okay, well, if you're over here and you're over here, let's just draw this map and then there's right. going to be this so, two-state so, system. So, no, so, okay, so there's two things. So there's a British mandate over here which try to manage this place. Now, the British mandate manage what we call today Jordan and what we call today Iraq, right? And eventually they start pulling out. Now, after World War I, they're starting to create those areas, those regions. And generally, you can see between World War I, let's say to 1945, the British trying to figure out how to manage this space, this region in general. And using certain families trying to create what will become the states. So the Saud family becomes Saudi Arabia. The Hashemite family becomes Jordan. By the way, the Hashemite family becomes Jordan and Iraq because they're divided between two brothers. And then between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean, they're looking at it and say, okay, what the hell are we going to do over here? There's Arabs over here, there's Jew Jews. Most people are Arab, but the Jews have that requirement. There's holy sites, there's the Mediterranean. Like, what do we do with it? While all that is happening with this dilemma of what do we do, that big question mark, when we have Second World War. Now, Britain also was traumatized by Second World War. And what you see following that, you see a beginning of a shrinking British Empire. I mean, they're pulling out of India, pulling out of everywhere. Also pulling out of the region in the Middle East. And not managing to handle this place over here, because differently than Jordan, where they just handed it over to a family, they didn't know who to hand it over. Who would you hand it over to? The Jews, to the Arabs, to whom? Hand it to the Arabs, the Jews will not be happy. Hand it to the Jews, the Arabs will not be happy. Anyhow, they wanted to get out, they handed it to the UN. And the UN was a new body. Remember that it's all nations traumatized by the Second World War that are trying to figure out what to do with this piece of land, which has all the holy sites. And two people who see themselves as native that are demanding the land. Some of them are living here, some of them are partly living here, but mostly are not, but see themselves as with a biblical connection. And the UN generally, I'm giving you the shortest version of history, puts a map on the on the table, which is called the partition plan, which generally look at demography. What Arab will be Arab, what will be Jewish will be Jewish, and that's the famous partition plan from 1947. That was not accepted. And we entered a war. And eventually the war defined, I want to say the borders, or as we saw on our trip together, we don't really have borders. Kind of like a mishmash of ceasefire lines that we have. Right. Um, and that's the current situation, pretty much. And yeah. part of those areas are still in a question mark. We have disputed borders or disputed lands. And uh, if you ask me, you know, everyone has a wishful opinion. What should be the future borders of Israel? But the truth is that if you ask me what will be the borders of Israel in 20 years, I have no idea. Yeah. And uh, it's getting more complicated with, I guess, settlements coming in with uh, people from Israel taking up, you know, things are getting expensive everywhere, so with more people moving around, I, right. it's been complicating things further, right. nor normalizing so areas. Israel, yeah, so Israel was, you know, founded between 40 to 67, and in 67, Israel took over the area of called the West Bank and the Sinai Desert, and the Gaza Strip as part of that six-day war. And it's actually fascinating to learn why, but we won't get into it, but... Uh, at first, we thought that now that we have that land, we will be able to negotiate with the countries that we took that land from and perhaps get a peace agreement, which did work with, with, with Egypt. We hand back the Sinai, and now we have peace for, with Egypt since pretty much since 1979. So that, that worked well. We never managed to get that agreement, not with Jordan, not with, uh, uh, with Syria. And the lack of agreement created a question mark. Now, as for the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which are the most uh, disputed and challenging territories and that's because all you of the amount of headlines. Right, everywhere. because that's with the amount of people, because that's where you've got Palestinian people, right? Jordan did uh, dismiss itself from that area, uh, handing over the mandate to the Palestinians to, ma to manage and to negotiate that piece of land with Israel. And there was an attempt called the Oslo Agreement in the 90s to try and reach an, uh, an agreement between us. It was supposed to last five years, and we should have had a two-state solution, a Palestinian state next to a Jewish state. That never worked, unfortunately, worked out. And you mentioned the word settlements. 
the controversy is that uh, we never annex that territory. Generally, it was never a Palestine, it was never a Palestinian entity before. And therefore, Israel is allowing itself to settle on that disputed land because it was not Palestinian, it was Jordanian, but Jordan kind of like removed their... their uh, their force. Uh, yeah, their force or their, their desire to have that place. Now, the controversy is, which me, me too, right, see that as a controversial idea, is if you've got a disputed land, which is not clear, and Israel never annexed that territory, you cannot settle there in the meanwhile. Now, in the meanwhile, Israel did settle, and specifically this current government right now is trying as much as it can uh, to expand in order to prevent a Palestinian state in the future. So the growth of settlements in the West Bank. Now you can argue whether legally or internationally legally we are allowed to or not, but it is clear that it is preventing, or it could prevent, if it haven't prevented already, a potential Palestinian state next to a Jewish state. Right. Which leaves it to what can we do? Leaving the status quo as it is, or just you know having this control over the Palestinians, which as a Jew I'm not interested in, or having a one-state solution. But if it's a one-state solution, Palestinians are in favor of a one-state solution, which will be a Palestine led by Palestinians, and Jews would want it to be a Jewish state led by right. Jews. So how do you do a one-state with two people? Uh, for someone that is not here and not engaged with the complexity on the ground, it's kind of like, like, yeah, why are you two people just create a bilingual? You need to come here and see how complicated that might be. Yeah, Because uh, uh, theoretically, I can explain how it works. But if you are on the ground and you'll see the sentiment, and you'll see the people, especially the, 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 the more extremes on both sides, but not only, you'll understand that it's easy to say, very difficult to implement. Yeah. I think talking about the extremes is an important component because um, the Prime Minister of Israel recently, had, had, when asked, um, you know, why, why can't we make peace? Um, Net, Net, yeah, correct. Um, he was saying that, well, it's hard to discuss uh, creating peace when people on the other side are don't believe your right to, to exist. Right. And I think that comes back to the, the, far, the far side of um, Islam, that, that is making things extra complicated and layered here. So I'm not sure only for the, the extremes of Islam that's not necessarily the whole region, because the issue with Israeli-Palestinian is not only religion, it's a national. Right. Jews are not only a religion, Jews are also a national identity. People. And, and a people, and Palestinians are the same thing. So, because you have a majority of the Palestinians are Muslims, but they're first Palestinians, and then Muslims, usually by identity. And you've got a lot of religious Palestinians. So it's actually two national movements, and it's a conflict between two national people, which are lo looking for recognition. And Netanyahu, I mean, is right. Majority of Palestinians do not recognize the right of Israel to exist, the right of Jews to the land, uh, and you, that can be proven by, by statistics. We have pollsters, Palestinian pollsters, that are proving that there is lack of recognition. At the same time, when you're looking at Israel, you do have a combination of people that either don't recognize the Palestinian people at all, or don't recognize a potential Palestinian state because there, were never, there, was, there was never one. And then other people that recognize it ideologically but are afraid of what it might be because of terrorism and such. So it creates eventually maybe a majority of people that for different, two different reasons are afraid of a future Palestinian state. Some of them ideologically agree that it should be but are afraid of implementing what they think is right. So you have two sides over here that are... Yeah. That are not able to to recognize the other. Right, and I think if you can share of where the um, there were some times when pulling pulling out was was attempted and that created more. Right. So the few times. So first of all, in '93 to '98, we started uh, what's called Oslo, and we started to pull out of areas and create those kind of like pockets of Palestinian authority, which are there until today, but that pocket they just don't have a continuity. And that was supposed to eventually lead to a Palestinian state. We were supposed to expand that. But in 2000, we started what's known as the Intifada, the second Intifada. Intifada is an Arab world for uprising. And there's a lot of violence. I mean, by the way, if you look at the cafe over there to your right, uh, it's called Max Brenner. 
two terrorists came and shot the whole people in the cafe right over there, uh, here in Sarona. And there's multiple of one in the space where we are right now. Now, generally, maybe that was because of extremists that did not accept any reconciliation with Israel, plus Arafat thinking that if he allowed that, Arafat was at the time the Palestinian leader, allow that Israelis who did compromise because of violence, it, violence did work, right? And did get a lot of Israelis to say, wait a minute, maybe we need to compromise because violent status quo is not good. Uh, it did get, maybe if we push Israel more, they'll be willing to give more. Eventually that led to a very violent era. Israelis understand that, it's called October 2000, as an attempt to provide the Palestinians 96 plus 4 percent of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. 96 percent plus a swap and a 4 percent. Because we don't have a Palestinian sitting over here, I'll just say. It means that I just told you that Israel offered 100 percent of the land. But Palestinians will understand it differently. Why? The land of Palestine is the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. The West Bank and the Gaza Strip is 22 percent. So when we offered 96 percent plus 4 of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, which looks like a good offer, what Palestinians heard is we were just offered to compromise over the 22% of our land. That's already something different. I don't know if the listeners can understand that. We need to open maps. But generally, Israelis and Palestinians, their narrative is so far away from one another, we never agreed about the opening line of any negotiation. Right. Anyhow, 2000, that collapse of the peace process led a lot of Israelis to say, wait a minute, we believe in a peace process, but we just offered 96% plus, 96 plus 4, and we're getting a deadly intifada, because people were blowing up themselves on the streets. So that got people a bit to the right, Israelis. Too far, that, by the way, that same year, we pulled out of Lebanon. We were, le we were located in South Lebanon, we pulled out our army, and long story short, that same Hezbollah, the organization which we pulled out, which is actually controlled by Iran in Lebanon, has today about 140,000 missiles aimed on every given place in Israel. So Israel said, okay, pulling out was not well also. 2005, we disengaged from Gaza. We did pull out, fully including uh, removing 8,000 settlers. That was a bit of criticism also over there. We didn't do it with an agreement. We, we could have maybe done it better. But the way most Israelis understand it is that we just pulled out. The number of missiles that were launched from Gaza prior to 2005 doubled. So Israelis are saying, wait a minute, so you have those people that will tell you, Israeli Jews, that will tell you, we're not interested in compromising because we don't believe in a Palestinian state in the first place. But then you have a center left to left, or a big center that will tell you, no, ideologically, we believe in a Palestinian state. Ideologically, we believe in a full equality. But we cannot fulfill what we ideologically think is right. Because if we do that, we will have more missiles, more violence, and so on. And that is leading to a lot of frustration. Yeah. Palestinians, by the way, every round that I just mentioned was, I want to say, as violent, more violent to the Palestinians. Because the military response was always very, very violent, right, yeah. and accurate. And therefore, every era that I'm describing, oh, Palestinians also. And eventually, Palestinians also lost their belief in a potential peace agreement. If we were that close in the 90s, okay, that collapsed. Our relationship is worse than it was in the beginning of the 90s, right? So some people tell you we miss the good old days before peace, right? So wait a minute. If they don't believe that we're going to do a two-state solution, especially when they see the settlements being expanded. Right. They don't believe that we will be willing for a one-state solution, so theoretically they're in favor of it, but they know that it's the Israeli Jews are not going to give for it. So on the other side, Hamas, by the way, that calls a one-state solution is getting a lot of support. But most of young Palestinians don't think that they're actually going to see it in their lifetime, right? So that is leading both sides to be very frustrated because they don't see, uh, in the near future, they don't see any potential arrangement. Yeah. So we are in this status quo. That status quo is comfortable for some and very uncomfortable for others. Yeah, that's... Yeah, uh it's hard to feel like you're on a chessboard where every move yeah. will, will, will be a negative negative outcome on, on both sides or either one of the sides. Um, and in the meantime, the difference between um, economic prosperity is continuing to, to get further and further apart. And I think part of that too is, is really interesting of how Tel Aviv specifically here, seeing all these skyscrapers getting put up, 
there's an incredible amount of prosperity that's coming in, specifically through the tech side and entrepreneurship. And I'm curious to hear what you think of the reasons are for that, especially around in relation to the military and mandatory service for every so, Israeli. So why do we have that startup? Like, yeah, what's that, what's what's bringing that? By the way, I don't think that the gap is actually growing. The gap were always big from the first place. Right. Uh, not in 1948, but you know, from since the 60s and 70s, the gap grew, and then it is two lines, two parallel lines of a big gap in between. Uh, overall, if you remember in Ramallah, you did see that there are, there are tech companies in Ramallah and so right. on. You can't compare it to Tel Aviv in any way, but it is in some ways Ramallah is performing better than a lot of Arab countries, economies, and so on. Uh, but back to the startup story over here. Traditionally and psychologically, we don't have any natural resources. By the way, what does it mean that psychologically we don't have any natural resources? We have a bit today offshore gas. We have the Dead Sea. Okay, so that's, you can't form a modern economy. So what happened is that Israel developed an ability of selling its only natural resource that it has, which is what we have between our ears, knowledge, information. And there is some unique skill that Israelis have, which is very innovative. It's not that we have a lot of ideas, but within the Israeli culture, you've got a phenomena that is uh, allowing Israelis, that is allowing uh, Israelis to translate their ideas into companies. Right. Uh, in percentage, more than any other place in the world. Now, why is that? Approach towards risk. When we talked a lot about conflict right now, mm -hmm. it means that almost every Israeli did face conflict in, of some sort in some point. So if we had missiles over here and we have potentially more missiles in the future, wait a minute, uh, to take a loan might not be the biggest risk that we have. Right. So approach towards risk, one. Number two, uh, since we don't have any other alternative, so the, the bodies of the government that are allowing it to operate, we have the chief scientists and we have all sorts of loans, I mean the, the, the government knows that it needs to invest in the human capital. Then you have culturally in Israel a very open mind towards failure. A lot of societies are not open towards failure. In Israel, yes. You go here to those tech companies which are surrounding us and ask for a presentation. It usually will be 90% of the presentation. We failed, we failed, we failed, we failed. And then the last minute, and we made an exit and we are now, I don't know what. And by the way, for every story of success, you have a hundred stories of failure, but we are always that's, that's mainly the success around us, right? There's a lot of people that went bankrupt on the on this. So the stories around us are stories of success. For every successful company, we have a few that failed. So what do we have? We have approach towards risk. We have the government. We have uh, an acceptance of failure. And then we have the lack of politically correctness is part of a story that in Israel, we don't follow a manual. It's almost in our DNA. We don't follow a manual. Yeah. You can understand everything about that, right? From the chef to the politics to everything. Directness and bluntness. And we don't respect any hierarchy of command, right? We don't like. We don't respect authority. It creates a chaotic environment around you. It creates a nightmare of an environment for a teacher. It creates great engineers. Right. Because an engineer, when you put a door which is closed, will look for the window. Um, it's very innovative. So put that in the last piece and you refer to it as a military. We have a mandatory, unfortunately by the way we have a conflict uh, and one of the outcomes we have a mandatory military service which a lot of, you know, not everyone will try to them serve, Arabs don't serve, but overall um, people serve in the military and it means that the military gets to pick all the 18 year old kids that they want. Definitely all the, the geeks, the kids on computers, right? And they go from a of serious screening. So if you have a brilliant kid, you take him at the age of 18, not too far from over here, across the road, and you are sitting over there and you give him all the most sophisticated, complicated challenges. After he did that for four or five years, then he goes to learn computer science. Yeah. And then he's doing reserve with the 18-year-old kids that are out of the box and know wild in their creative abilities. And that is a phenomenon that you cannot cut and paste anywhere else. In America, you need to work with the people that come to you. Here you go to the people that you want and you pick them up. So that creates a phenomenon 
over here where the military feeds a lot of tech and innovative culture into universities and yeah. into the tech scene which is all around us and yeah we have more you know the statistics here are, are incredible uh, more startups per capita I mean actually this area we used to have the Rothschild Boulevard with the resume of the more startups per square kilometer than any other square kilometer in the world and actually this area over here all those sky rides that are around us yeah. This is actually now the, con the, the most concentrated tech area in Israel. Mm. Uh, it moved over here all around us. Um, and you are looking at 10% of Israelis that are working somehow within the tech industry. And that goes to about 55% of the taxes. So yeah. you are looking at, you know, and by the way, Tel Aviv, which is 5% Tel Aviv municipality, 5% of the population of Israel, 20% of the taxes. A right. big story is all those tech companies that are all around here. Yeah. So. I, and I think the interesting thing throughout all of this, it's as a North American, always trying to find the correlation of, of, of things in context with how things are going politically and so forth in, in the United States or in Canada. And I, I think it's interesting that you just can't compare the left and right to the left and right of North America. And even the thought of, um, you know, tr you could probably make the stereotype that in the United States, most uh, people in the army would be conservative or in the military. They've got a conservative mentality, would vote conservatively. And here, it's almost different than that right. because the ultra-conservative don't serve in the army. You've got the ortho ultra-orthodox, they're allowed to not serve. Their mission is to essentially stay home and study right. the, the Torah. Um, you've got... The, if you're Arab descent, you're not allowed, you don't No, you have can, if you're not Arab descent, if you're Jewish, you can. If you're an Arab non-Jew, you can volunteer if you want to, but you, it's not mandatory for you to serve. Right. Right. Uh, which are also, they tend to be more conservative families and have conservative backgrounds. So when you're looking at the military, the military is quite liberal. Now, how do you measure liberalism? Check about gender equality, check about uh, LGBTQ within the army, the ability of the army of receiving. Not that people are not facing difficulties. Right? right, but nothing's perfect. I don't want to. But um, you have combat gay officers that are openly gay and will be accepted. Um, and when you're looking at the heads of military in the last 10, 15 years, they usually go after they finish the army. They go into politics. Right. You'll see that they're on the liberal camp. Right. So the military tends to be liberal, even though. Among the soldiers, you'll have a representation of all the country, except the ultra orthodox. Although there is a few units of ultra orthodox, but they're small. You've got that also. But yeah, the military, and that's why going back to what you said, you can't liberal. Canadian liberal is not an Israeli liberal. We're in the Middle East. It's a different politics, different conversation. Uh, and perhaps we should need to say something about those protests that are, you know, international people are, yeah. are hearing about it. Look, that also is very nuanced. There is a, actually a discussion right now within Israel, what is a democracy? Uh, we don't have a constitution, we don't have a, a upper house, a lower house, and therefore our only checks and balances are the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court can outlaw any law that is legislated by the parliament. So today, you can, if you're the parliament, you can legislate that people with a ponytail are not allowed on the street. Well, the Supreme Court can say, sorry, that is illegal, according to a list of what's called basic laws or constitutional law that they have, and, uh, and bring down that law, which means that the Supreme Court of Israel is above the parliament. So you have two camps today, the camp that supports the current government, that are saying that the system as it is right now is not democratic, because the Supreme Court are 15 judges that don't represent the public. And therefore, you've got 15 non-representative people that are overlooking the because, parliament. Because they're not... Because they are not voted not politically, they are voted yeah. by a, like a committee, which is not political, it's very professional. So it means that the elected parliament actually cannot always implement what the people that voted for them are actually requiring. So they see that as a non-democratic system which needs to be reformed. The camp which is against the current government is saying, wait a minute, democracy is not only about implementing what the majority wants, it's maintaining the minority which naturally will be underrepresented and maintaining their own human rights. Otherwise, you'll have a community of 15% that will never have the majority. How do you protect them from the majority? So it is two camps that are protesting on the weekends and on the Saturdays, and both of them are yelling, 
democracy. They're just not agreeing what democracy actually is. That is the facade of those protests, which are heated up. And when you talk to Israelis, they're interested of talking to you only about it and all the rest of the things that we talked about, Israelis now are not engaged with. It's, yeah. it's, it's there. It's all there. The Palestinian issue, all of that is there. It's important. But it's right now at the back. And the facade of what's bothering Israelis is what is a democracy, but behind it is what will be the future of Israel? What will Israel be like? What kind of Israel will it be for our kids? Will it be more religious? So the inner conflicts in the concept of a Jewish state, the inner conflicts among Jews, what does it mean a Jewish state? Is it a religious state? Less? Is Judaism as a nationality, as an identity, as a religion? What does it mean a Jewish state? Should we have transportation of the Sabbath or should we not? Those are issues that will actually shape what those streets around us are going to look like. That's part of it. How are we going to handle Palestinians? Are we going to expand settlements? Are we going to, are we going to be liberal on that front or not? Liberal, what about LGBTQ? What about women's rights? So people are protesting under the title of judicial reform, yes or no. Actually, what, what kind of Israel will we have, by the way, in five years? Not in a hundred years five years, ten years, because changes that can happen now in five, ten years can have a domino effect on on the future. And people are heated up around those topics. Yeah. And also with um, the stats looking that Israel's population is, is growing tremendously, right. a lot of people are coming in, moving in, it's also um, beautiful beaches and lovely right. place to live, and, and now with the tech booming, so it's, it's, a, it's an important conversation. And like you said, Absolutely. both sides are arguing no, I'm right because I'm for democracy. And you're like, right. the other right. side saying, Absolutely. no, I'm for democracy. Right, the, the, so. exactly. By the way, we are growing not only because of immigration, we are growing mainly because of natural birth. Right. Uh, big families. Yeah, and that's specifically on the conservative More, orthodox yeah. side. Yeah, I mean, I'm a liberal person with five kids, but most of us liberal people will have smaller families and the conservative people will have bigger families. So from birth rate alone, if you're trying to see the trend, you're looking towards what potentially will be a more conservative location. So when you're in Tel Aviv here, startup tech and everything around us stands for liberalism, people are concerned that what does that mean, a more conservative Israel? And yeah. Well, we just covered a lot of, a lot of ground and a lot of topics here. Um, so especially from someone that's been always kind of on the outside, only really understanding things from brief mentions in classrooms or just headlines. Um, what do you feel is, are some important takeaways for people that are not as engaged regularly um, so, to, to understand? Two things. One, most of the information that people are, are receiving is through Instagram, TikTok, and it's usually headlines or a quote or a picture. The, look, the situation in Israel, no matter what, Israeli, Palestinian, domestic, Jewish, Jewish, Palestinian, Palestinian, Hamas, Fatah, all the different is nuanced and complex. And there's not one sentence of visual or video that can do justice to what's happening here on the ground. So whoever is receiving on their feed from people like them, the same kind of video, the same idea, you better know that there is, if you would have a different crowd around, you would just get a completely different story and be aware of that and know that it's really nuanced. So I always say, just, you know, Pay attention to the to the nuance. Don't every sentence that you say you can say yes, but and add something completely different. And the second thing that I want to point out as we are wrapping up: be careful from people like myself or any other professional storyteller. Storytellers want drama. If we would sit over here and talk about the pigeon and the raven and the two kids that were making noise next to us, okay, that would be probably boring. What did we do? We talked about it pretty much. We went from almost one conflict to another. We didn't have time, otherwise we would talk about Iran and about Syria and about a whole other thing. We, yeah. we never got to it. But that's what we would probably do. Why? Because we want to attract our crowd. Conflict attracts crowd. Right. And the fact that we are here in Tel Aviv and we are, we are hearing, you know, the noise of construction of birds and of noise of children that are on vacation, and that will be here, that will be also in Ramallah, that will never make it to the news because there's no story. So you just need to remember that the, la the, the no story is also part of reality over here and not everything is as dramatic as we, right. we tend to think. Absolutely. I, I was 
had a lot of people, you're going to Israel and there's protests and you know it's dangerous and those are the headlines that often come through and, and there's violence in all places in the world but because it's already such a heated thing, if there's violence in the Gaza Strip or in the West Bank, it seems like it's automatically to the front lines right. um, for headlines and I've greatly enjoyed my time here as well as in the West Bank and Palestine. Uh, people have been warm and friendly and the food's been fantastic and so I've, I've been very grateful to spend some time here and understand not just some of the deep history that's here, but also give more context to the nuance of uh, the many people and the identities that, that are here in this space. And John, so. you're an outdoor person. We have world-class outdoor activities from surfing, windsurfing, kite surfing, biking, climbing. I mean, name absolutely. it, we've got it over here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well. Michael Bauer, thank you so much for taking the time again. It's my pleasure, um, thank you. The book here, Israel Journey, Eight Days in One of the World's Most Complex Countries, covers so much ground and really appreciate your time to, to drop in and for all your commitment to helping share more of the, the complexity and giving it a bit more of context on both sides. So thank, thank you, John. Yeah. Where can people find some more information about you or or some of the stuff that you work on? Generally, I'm on Instagram at Bauer Trails. I'm on the different social medias. Uh, I've got a website called Bauer Trails also. Um, that's Perfect. usually... You know. Great. Thank you again for tuning in. My name is John. It's been a pleasure to sit here in Tel Aviv um, and dive into some of the intense complexity and rich history on all the sides for this place, Israel and Palestine and the Middle East. So thank you for joining us here today. And we'll stay tuned for next time. For more info or content from Momentum Collective or to apply for one of our international artist residencies, visit MomentumCollective.com. That's Momentum, M-O-M-E-N-T-O-M. -M -E -M. The Momentum podcast theme you're listening to is the track Beam Me Up by our friend and producer Arterium. For more eclectic soundscapes, find Arterium on SoundCloud.